Please open your Bible this morning to the beginning of the Gospel of John. Of the four Gospels, three are called synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each wrote giving a synopsis or a summary of the life of Christ. John's book is written very differently. It is not a synoptic Gospel. It was the last of the four books written about 30 years after the other three were written. Likely the other disciples were dead by now And there were two great problems facing the church. One was a loss of its first love. In spite of the fact it was only about 90 AD, some of the great warmth and strength and fervor of that New Testament church was already ebbing away. And so John, writing under the impetus of the Holy Spirit, addressed himself to this problem. If there's any person in this audience this morning who feels like your first love for Christ has somehow grown cool, this book is addressed to you. If at one time you spent more time with him, if once you walked closer to him, it is this problem to which John addresses himself in this gospel. The second problem is the problem theologians call Gnosticism. The philosophy of Gnosticism taught that spiritual knowledge was all important, but faith was not necessary in the Christian life. Gnosticism also taught that all material things were evil, only spiritual things are good. Therefore, God could surely not have come down and taken on a human body. That would be evil. It was really a belittling of the divine nature of Jesus. And oh, how that must have hurt John, who loved him so. John knew that Jesus was human because for three years they had walked side by side. He had watched the footsteps in the sand. He knew that Jesus was human. And John knew that Christ was divine because of the miracle that had happened in his own life. The son of thunder had become the beloved disciple. And so John addresses himself to this problem of the belittling of the divine human Christ. And by the way, it's a beautiful young person's book also because it's a story written by a man who saw his young life turned around and turned toward Christ. This morning we're going to study only the first part of the first chapter of John's Gospel. And as we read these verses, may I ask you to watch out for three terms that we're going to focus on today and see how often you find them in the passage we're going to read. The term word. Secondly, the term light. And then thirdly, life. See how many times those three are used as we read John 1, the first five verses, and then verses 9 through 14. John chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And down to verse 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, 
nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You have there in a nutshell encapsulated form the entire gospel of Jesus. John says that we can live forever through Christ, the word, through Christ, the light, through Christ, the life. You can live forever. Now let's look first of all at the term, the illustration word. I would like to suggest that through Christ, the word, you can know what God is like. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, that first and last verse that we just read again. You'll notice it. John 1, verses 1, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Four times here, Jesus is called the Word. Why is Jesus called Word? We hold this up and we say, this is Word. But the scriptures say that Jesus also was Word. Why? Because we communicate through words. Jesus was called word because he came to communicate to man what God is like. Communication is through word. Therefore, Jesus is called word. By the way, it is God's desire to communicate with us. It is God's desire. It is his nature to reveal himself to man, not to hide himself. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they hid in the garden. When God came, he searched for them. Same with the story of Jonah. When he ran away from God, he went and hid and headed just the opposite direction from where God had called him. But God followed him. God was with him the whole time. God searched for him. It is a natural tendency when we have gone away from God to hide ourselves from him. But God comes searching, and if you find yourself separated from God this morning, guess who's hiding? It is God's nature to reveal himself. So God wanted to communicate to man what God was like, and therefore he sent the word, his son. We communicate best through words. Every wife knows it. Every husband's probably lived through it. He's just rolled over and is still about half asleep when he feels a soft little touch on his shoulder. Honey, do you love me? Now that could mean I love you truly, or it could mean drop dead. Any of you ladies ever get that reaction? And so she persists, do you love me? Yes, dear, I love you. But how much do you love me? You see, we all need the assurance of knowing that we are accepted, of knowing that we are loved, and that assurance comes best in words. God knew that we, lost mankind, need the assurance that God loves us. And so he sent the word to communicate that fact to us. He wanted us to understand what he was like. He wanted us to understand his character. And through words, we express character. How better to understand the character of God than through the word? You know Mrs. Jones? No, I've seen her in church, but I haven't talked to her. But you sit down and you talk for an hour with Mrs. Jones. Do you know Mrs. Jones? Yes. After an hour's exchanging of words, you feel like you pretty much know the individual and you have a number of conclusions that you may have come to from spending that much time with an individual. 
We express character through words. What if somebody whom you had never met handed you a pile of CDs, cassettes, whatever format you want to use, on which was recorded every word that they had said for the past week? Every word. Don't you think that you could sit down and listen to all of those words and come up with a fairly accurate assessment of the character of that person? You'd listen to the words that he uses for his wife or directed toward his children or maybe his fellow employees or maybe his neighbor or even his dog alongside the words that he uses in church. And you'd know something about that man's hypocrisies. You listen to the words he uses in anger, and you'd know something about the level of hostility that he's carrying. You could even scientifically count the number of times he uses each word, and when you would add them up, when you would know the words that he used the most, you would know what he loves best. Because whatever we love best, we talk about the most. Words then are an expression of character. And so God sent the word as an expression of his character. Now let's notice verse 18. John, the first chapter and verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Jesus came not to declare himself, he came to declare the Father. Actually, if Jesus has done a good job of convincing you that Jesus is love, he has in some sense failed as the word. Jesus came to convince us that the Father is love. And when you study the loving life of Christ, remember to look beyond it because he, as the word, is trying to help you understand the Father. He did not, he said, testify of himself. And that's why it's so important for us to study the Gospels, because in them Jesus reveals to us what God is truly like. You know, it occurs to me that sometimes the lives of Christians convince people that they're pretty nice people. They're honest. They're likable. They're dependable. But how many times do the lives of Christians give Christ the credit? You see, the purpose of Christian living is not to convince people that I am a nice person, but that God is a great God. Christians are often just nice enough to attract attention to themselves, but selfish enough to want that attention for themselves. Do the people who know that you are different, that you can sometimes hold your cool when others can't, do they know that it's because of Christ in your life? Or do they simply say, oh, he's a nice person. She's a nice person. The purpose of Christianity is to reveal that God is a great God, that he is love, and that he changes lives. And so Christ, the word, depicted the character not so much of himself, even though they had identical qualities in their characters, but his focus was to give people an accurate description of what the Father was like. And what did the life of Christ say about the Father? The life of Christ said, first of all, that God is a real person. Now, I don't know, maybe your faith is stronger than mine, but sometimes I find it kind of difficult to worship God as a spirit. But don't you see, ever since the life of Jesus, God has been perceived through our senses. Verse 14 again, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you notice those two little two-letter words, us and we? John isn't saying, I heard that this is what Jesus did. He is saying that this happened to him. Christ dwelt among us. He's talking about himself and the other disciples, and we beheld his glory. It's a firsthand experience. He said, this is what I'm writing to you about. This is what I experienced, what I saw. John knew that Jesus was real because he had seen him every day for three years. He had heard him speak publicly and privately. 
He had sat at the table over a thousand different days and they had eaten together. He had reached out and touched him any number of times. Yes, dare I say, he even smelled the odor of a human body in Jesus. He knew that Jesus was real. If you are of a skeptical frame of mind, if you find it difficult to believe that God is real, take a look at the life of Jesus. Take a look and study the historical Jesus. Jesus was real. Now, God is a person. And since God is a person, it would be best to depict God by means of a person. And so God sent Jesus. When the first explorers came to America, they found a new kind of civilization, a new kind of people. They called them Indians, thinking they had reached the Far East over toward India. And of course, they were commissioned to bring back details of what they had found. Somebody back there was footing the bill. And they could have just taken back some of the Indian crafts. They did that. They could have just described the Indians or drawn pictures of the Indians and things about their culture that they experienced there. They also did that. But they knew that back in Europe, they needed to accurately know what an Indian was like, and so they took an Indian back with them. That's how it is with God. He knows that we need to know what he is like, that he is real, that he is a person. And so he sent a real person, his son, to depict the character of God. When you look at the real Jesus, when you look at the loving Jesus, you know that God is real, that God is loving. You know through the word what God is like, what his character is like. Again, if you want to know what God is really like, find a red letter edition of the Bible and read the words of Jesus over and over again. Jesus, the word. And then secondly, John says that through Christ, the light, we can overcome sin's darkness. Notice this analogy now of light and dark. John 1, verses 4 and 5. John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Light and darkness... Light represents good. Light represents Christ. Darkness represents bad. Darkness represents the devil in this analogy. And one of the lessons it teaches us is that the power of Christ is greater than the power of Satan. Verse 5, the latter part, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness did not comprehend the light. Did you ever find that difficult to understand? It's one of those words that we wouldn't use in that way in today's language. Of course, darkness can't understand light, but that's not the meaning of the term comprehend here. What does it mean that the darkness did not comprehend the light? It means that it did not overtake the light. It did not overcome the light. It did not master the light. It did not extinguish the light. Light always extinguishes darkness. Darkness does not ever have the power to extinguish light. And just as light extinguishes darkness, Christ will overcome Satan. And just as darkness cannot extinguish light, as hard as he tried at Calvary, Satan could not have power over Christ. Doesn't it do your faith good this morning to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we worship, has power over evil, has power over Satan. Right will triumph over evil as surely as light triumphs over darkness. Now let's look a little closer at our own lives. It seems to me that the light analogy says that through Christ, you can overcome the blackest, the darkest sin in your life. Dark is never so black that light cannot extinguish it. I imagine everyone's been inside a cave, probably. I love going down in caves. Carlsbad is one of my favorite places. I've been to Karchner too, but... I'm kind of a huge fan of uh, Carlsbad Caverns. But it's just amazing, the formations, just the expansiveness, the 
this enorm enormousness. I've never been to Mammoth Cave. Sometime I'd like to go there also. Very interesting going down in the cave. It's just the darkest place I know of on the face of the earth. I mean, way, way down, not just inside the entrance and stuff where light kind of works its way down and penetrates down a little bit. But you go down a bunch of corridors and you go to where absolutely no light is going to get there. And you get way down there in the bottom and the bowels of the earth and you just turn the lights out for a moment. And you just literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. Complete darkness, intense darkness. So dark it's a little panicky. You can almost feel the darkness. And then someone lights just a single match. Can dark ever be so intense that light cannot extinguish it? Never. This is John's analogy. Your sins can never be so black. You can never have gone so far wrong, but that the light of Jesus Christ has power over the darkness in your life. Nobody has gotten their heart into such a black state of self-centeredness that the light of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot extinguish the darkness within your soul. At creation, God stepped out into nothingness, and the Lord Jesus spoke, and suddenly from darkness there was light. And if you will let that same creator step into your life today, there will be light in your life where there was only darkness before. One more lesson from the light. Did you know that the power of choice is even suggested here? We have the power to let Christ in or to shut him out. Verses 9 through 11. John chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own received him not. It is possible to shut out the light. Now, you can't do that with all of your senses. That's why light was a particularly appropriate analogy. We were going down the highway, and suddenly you smelled a dead skunk on the highway. It's pretty hard not to. Well, skunks are beautiful animals, but they don't ever smell good dead on a highway. Now, did you ever try to twist your nose so far over that you could shut off that sense of smell and block it? You just don't have the ability to do that. You don't have the machinery for it. You could try pinching it shut, of course, but your nose isn't made in such a way that it can by itself shut out smell. Or were you ever quietly relaxing in your backyard in the early evening hours and then suddenly you found yourself listening to your neighbor's hi-fi rap music or rock and roll so loud and so vibrating it made the earthworms come out of the lawn on your side of the fence? <laughs> and did you ever decide, I'm going to shut that off, I'm going to close my ears? Now you can hold your fingers over them, but your ears don't have any way of closing up by themselves. But your eyesight, did you ever have somebody walk up to you with a flashlight and thrust it into your face? Grandkids are really good about doing that, you know? Just light it. What do you do instantly? You close your eyes. You don't have to put your hands over your eyes. You don't have to turn away. Instantly, your eyelids close. You have the ability to control what comes into your eyes. John chose to represent Christ with one of the senses that we have the opportunity of shutting off, saying we can shut out Christ. If we choose, we can shut off the light. But when we do, there's nothing left but darkness. Isn't it good to know that Jesus, the light, has power over darkness, not just in the world or with the devil, but he has the light to light up whatever corner of darkness there is in your soul. Jesus Christ, the light. 
And then the third analogy that John uses here, through Christ, the life we can live forever. Verses 3 and 4. John 1, 3, and 4. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. In him was life. Nothing was accomplished at creation except through Christ the creator. Nothing is accomplished in the recreation of these sinful souls except through Christ the creator. There can be no life, whether it be physical or spiritual, except through the divine creation of Christ. Eternal life is impossible through genetics. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about life, not available through the blood or through the bloodline. Bad, bad news to the Jews of Christ's day. By the way, how many of you were born Seventh-day Adventist Christians? See your hands? I see a few hands. Now, I know what you mean by raising your hand. (laughs) That you were born to parents who were Christians, that you were born in a Christian home. But really, nobody is born a Christian. You are all born as sinners just like the rest of us. Salvation does not come through the bloodline. Did you ever hear the expression, God has no grandchildren? Oh, it's true. He has lots of children of all ages. How he loves them and how he cares for each one of them. But you have no relationship to Christ just because you had a parent who was the son or a daughter of God. God does not have grandchildren, only children. Our relationship with him is not inheritable. It is only individual, it is only personal, not through the bloodline, says John. Now, sin runs in the blood, grace does not. Isn't that interesting? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they were sorry, they were forgiven. And they were saved by grace, just like you and I. In due time, Eve presented her firstborn. And to the blood of Cain, there was injected that awful self-centeredness of sin. But not grace. Sin, you see, is natural, that we inherit. That's in the blood of all people. But God doesn't force himself upon us the way that Satan does. We can have grace only if we have individuals choose it. And so John is saying that life is not through genetics. Eternal life is impossible through an exercise of your will. Verse 13 again. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You cannot will yourself to live eternally. You cannot will yourself to be Christ-like. You can will to yield yourself to Christ. But we cannot be saved by an exercise of the will. We can only be saved through God's grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now let's put it all together. Eternal life is not possible through the bloodline, through genetics. It's not possible through deciding I'm going to be good. It's not possible through an exercise of the will. It is possible through Christ. Verses 12 and 13 again. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Eden, the creator created, the clay simply yielded. And as these self-centered lives of ours are recreated into the image of God, God works the miracle. Christ is still the creator. Our part is to be moldable 
yielding clay. And so in introducing his book, John has kind of given us the whole gospel in a nutshell. You can live forever through your acceptance of Christ, the word. He came to communicate to you what God is like, to show you that God is love. He makes God attractive, someone whom you want to associate with, someone you want to get to know, someone that you're pleased to serve. And then secondly, Christ is the light. He has power over the darkness of sin, not only in the world, but in your personal life. He has the power over the darkness of sin in your life. And finally, Christ is the life, the divine creator, the source of all life. Through him, you can live eternally. Notice it all centers on Christ. This was John's message. Anything less would be less than the gospel. It all centers on Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You look at John's mission statement, I would like to say in John 20, verses 30 and 31, John describing why he wrote the book, he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Our passage today says that he came to his own, and his own received him not. Why not? Why did the church reject him then? Because brothers and sisters, there are two kinds of righteousness. There is self-righteousness and there is Christ's righteousness. And the church of John's day was so certain of the first that they felt no need of the second. Has the church changed all that much? Do you look today at the righteousness of Christ or do you look at the goodness in your own life and the morality of your own existence and feel rather complacent and self-satisfied with that, especially as you compare yourself to other people? That's such a dangerous thing to do. Well, I'm better than so-and-so. I don't do what he does. No, that's not comparing yourself to the righteousness of Jesus. A beggar needs money. And he stands out on the street corner holding out his hand. He doesn't earn it. But the kindness and the charity and the grace of some good passerby holds out to him a $100 bill. Somebody else has done it for him. It's a gift. But only when he accepts the bill and he closes his fingers around it is the money really his. And believe me, he grabs that tightly. And that, brothers and sisters, is the way it is with salvation. That's the way it is with eternal life. I cannot earn it. I do not deserve it. But I can reach out my hand. And only if I reach out and accept it, if I claim it for myself, is it really mine. This morning, I want to reach out. Will you join me in reaching out to Jesus? I want to reach out and accept Christ, the word. I want to reach out and accept Christ, the light. Christ, the life. I want to reach out with the desperation of a beggar. I want to clutch him tightly, the pearl of great price. And as I daily take Jesus by the hand of trust and faith, salvation is mine. I will live forever. I'm going to close with just one powerful text 
John 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Not maybe someday, hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Praise God. For that assurance that we can have that today everlasting life begins for each one of us. And that Satan cannot dis extinguish the light that God puts into our lives. Now in lieu of our closing hymn, I still miss our singing. I have chosen a hymn that I'm going to read. You can thank me later. If you want to follow along with the words, you know, sometimes I think we get so used to an old hymn that we're familiar with that we tend to get caught up in the melody and we kind of say the words by memory and we don't really think about the words or the application in our lives. So in a sense, I kind of like being able to do this to close out, uh, to close out our message today. 435 in your hymnal, the glory song. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. When by the gift of his infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place, just to be there and to look on his face, will through the ages be glory for me. Friends will be there I have loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet, just a smile from my Savior, I know, will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Amen. Dear loving Father in heaven, we cannot thank you enough, we cannot express it enough how much we love you today for sending Jesus, the word, to clear up any misconceptions we might have about you, to show us what you are truly like, that you're a God of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and healing. And we see from the words of John, your servant, that you're also the light. And we're so thankful that whatever darkness exists in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, that the light of Jesus will cast out that darkness, that that darkness cannot exist in the presence of light. And then we're so thankful today that we can celebrate Jesus the life and that we can have the assurance today that everyone listening to this message today from your servant John can have that assurance that today they have eternal life and that nothing can take that away if we keep our relationship with you. And so every day, Lord, may we go to the word and may we receive the light and keep us in your care as we live our lives eternally with you is my prayer in Jesus name.
Amen.